And awesome. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Bar Hashem. We're back. Yay. Um, so after our long break, because Tishrei this year was all Wednesday nights, basically. Um, literally all Wednesday nights. Now we are back with Shar Happy Tachin. Um, for anyone who hasn't been here for the previous classes, you can watch all the recordings. You can watch them on our YouTube channel. So you can go on YouTube and search Living Chassidus, or you can listen to them on Spotify or Google Podcast or Apple Podcast or <laughs> rah, 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 all the other podcasts. Uh, platforms anchor.fm we're just everywhere thank you shout out to Dina and shout out to Rachel okay so you can totally catch up now we did a beautiful job last time at scheduling ourselves that we finished the very long introduction and we finished Perak Aleph so now we're going to begin by Perak on Perak Bays um, for anyone who's here Baruch Hashem, we have a lot of copies these are just the two that are on over here, there's a lot more copies in the back. If you would like a copy, they are at a huge discount. Living Chassidus, we do lots of good discounts. So it's only $22 um, instead of like close to 30 in other stores. And you are welcome to take one, use it, and then um, send us money or pay. So we are currently on page 46 for all of you who have a book and are following along. I'm writing notes over here. <laughs> Yeah, it's on our regular Zoom. Um, <laughs> do you, you don't know our regular Zoom? Here, I'll post. I'll post it one second. Um, it is on our regular Zoom. There we go. I'm really behind on one of these things. Um, and you can always join Wednesday nights, although. It is so much more fun to teach to real humans than to teach to a screen. So I really appreciate everyone who made the effort to come tonight in person. So shout out to everyone who's here and a round of applause. Baruch Hashem. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the crew that is walking in right as I'm about to begin. All right. In the first part. <laughs> We are on page 46. Oh, wonderful. Yay, you guys just made my day. Okay. In the first part of this chapter, which is chapter two, <laughs> um, we are going to say, okay, the first part of this chapter, the author lists seven qualities. So seven, um, seven qualities of a person that a person who is being trusted must possess in order to fully gain other people's trust. In the second part of the chapter, which is funny that they literally give you the answer. It's just like, when I first learned Sharpie Tachlan, it wasn't through this book. So I didn't have any explanation. And I was just like, wow, this is so cool. And then the second part of the chapter, you're like, oh, what? So here they just, uh, what do you call it? When they break it to you, they, um, they give away the ending, they, whatever. So anyway, so they give away the ending. Spoiler alert, thank you, yes. <laughs> Spoiler alert, because it definitely tells you exactly what's gonna happen, which, whatever. So in the second part of the chapter, <clears throat> the author cites verses, Psukim, to describe that only Hashem possesses all of these seven qualities. So are, there are seven things that we have, a person has to have in order for us to trust them. And then we realize that the second part that in order to really trust someone all, with all those seven qualities, the only, you can't even say Hashem is an it, a him, a nothing, but the only Hashem that is Hashem is the only one who can actually fulfill all of seven of them. Um, spoiler alert. Okay. Therefore, it only makes sense to put our trust in Hashem and not in anyone else. Um, give me a second. Okay. Now I'm wondering if we started this already, but anyway. <laughs> you guys are all good fresh. Review. We're all good. Okay. Um, right. So a good thing to think about 
while we learned these seven things is that as much as as much as I already spoiler alerted everybody and we spoiled the ending of the story but as much as we know that only Hashem is the one that has all seven qualities we still should take a moment to process these qualities and realize that if we work on them we can be a better person for ourselves and we can be a better person for our friends with Hashem better person for our husbands because if we can foster these qualities then our husbands, our friends, our family members, our coworkers, our bosses, they can trust us better. They can feel more comfortable putting their trust on us. And again, we're not comparing to Hashem because we'll see that Hashem can only really truly do all of them. But if only we take some time to really process these and say, wow, I could really learn from them how I can be a much, a much more trustworthy person. Does that make sense? Okay. The author begins this chapter by enumerating the seven qualities. There are seven factors that enable a trusting person to trust another creation. Number one, a friend must show that he truly cares about his fellow. The first factor, a friend must possess the character traits of compassion, empathy, and love. Okay, so these are the first, first thing we need to do is that we're able to care for someone else with compassion, empathy, and love. Let's translate those for a second and let's make them really practical. What does compassion mean? Compassion means that you're able to truly care for someone else with, with an appreciation for where they are holding. Not where you expect from them, not what you want them to be, not where you, know, you have vision or you think they're meant to be, Compassion means having holding space for them and caring for them where they are. And that's okay. Empathy. Empathy is a very, very beautiful concept. And I want to translate the difference between empathy and sympathy. For anyone who doesn't yet know, I spent many years of my life living in the South. I spent my part of my childhood living in Birmingham, Alabama. And I know everyone's going to be like, whoa, Alabama. Oh, yeah. Um, so in Alabama, there is a very common saying. When something is happening, um, it's usually the very Southern mothers, grandmothers that go, oh, bless her heart. Bless her heart. And, and it's this concept of someone's going through a struggle, but oh, bless her heart. And at the end of the day, bless her heart, you blessed her heart, and that's beautiful and all. When it comes down to it, what change did that comment make for them? They, they, they just blessed her heart, and they don't even think about what they're saying half the time, and I'm going to be honest, they don't. Um, so sympathy can sometimes feel like, oh, bless her heart. Sympathy can feel, ah. Oh, poo on you too bad that you're going through a struggle it's you know okay what am i gonna do oh, whatever you know poor you <laughs> pardon my 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 saying but sucks to suck you know like <laughs> sucks to suck oh so sad you know too bad whereas empathy is a whole different dimension and once we're able to really connect with empathy we can appreciate not just how we present empathy and how we can give empathy, but also how Hashem has empathy for us. Empathy means you're not trying to fix them. You're not trying to get rid of them. You're just being there for them. For everyone who's, <laughs> for everyone who's ever, which uh, I'm not going to do a raise of hands because I know it's the entire class. <laughs> Well, I guess, except for the newborn in the room, um, for anyone who has ever had a friend or a family member that's, you know, got hurt in any way. I mean, I have, let's say children that come, they scrape their knees and we have a tendency to be like, it's okay. It's okay. You're okay. You are okay. Right. Because we feel uncomfortable that they're not okay. So we make them okay. And we make sure that we tell them that they're okay. Right that doesn't feel like empathy. 
empathy means feeling understood. Empathy means that person is there with me in my place, even if they can't and won't fix anything. There's a stereotypical thing, you know, men and women and marriage and whatever, where they say <clears throat> the wife comes, she has a nail in her forehead. Have you guys, you've seen this, heard of this, right? She has a nail in her forehead. Okay. There's a, it's a joke slash video joke, whatever, but she has a nail on her forehead and she's sitting there with her husband and she's like, but my head, it hurts. And there's this thing in my head and she like keeps rambling about it. And he's like, but I can just pull it out. Can I just take it out for you? Can I? And she's like, stop trying to fix it. I just want to talk about it. <laughs> right? So yes, sometimes we just need someone to understand us. We just need that empathy. We don't need someone to feel bad for us. We don't need someone to have sympathy and be like, oh, ugh, poor you. Bless your heart. Right? We don't need that. We need someone to just be there for us, be a listening ear, hold space for us, and just, just be. We also don't need someone to fix us. Many times, half the problems, we have our own solution. And we just need some time to vent. We just need some time to process it ourselves. And we need some time to feel okay with where we are so we can fix ourselves. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Hashem has this. He has compassion. He sees you where you are. He has empathy. He's able to hold that space for you when you just need someone who will have pride and, and appreciation for you no matter where you are at that point right he's 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 not trying to fix you and he's not trying to uh shut you down you know like oh you hurt your you hurt yourself you like, it's okay you're fine you're fine right you're fine you know we've seen parents do that you're okay you're okay they also need some time to just cry and that's okay too you know and love, and Hashem has love. And we all, I think love is one of the most commonly used ones. We've discussed it. If you, if you need some appreciation for love, you can always learn Tanya. Um, okay, so continuing on. So the first thing that a person has in order for us to be able to trust them, that they should be compassionate, they should be empathetic, and they should be loving. Knowing that a friend has compassion and empathy for him, a person will place his trust in his friend and have peace of mind due to his reliance on him regarding all pressing matters. Now take a moment and think about your closest friend or the sister that you talk to or your mother, whoever is that person that when, when things are getting rough, you turn to them. Are they the type to shut you down, judge you where you are, um, not love you? You know, like generally the people that we connect with when we're feeling down or we're feeling vulnerable and in a, in a hard place are the people who have these three factors. Does that make sense? Now, let's take a moment and think about it. How can we have more of these three factors for other people? And just take a second to process that. Okay. A person who knows that his friend truly cares will feel confident that his friend will fulfill any request asked of him. Number two, right? So that was number one. Number two. However, compassion alone is not enough to create trust in the person he cares about. Although the friend may care a lot about his fellow, it is possible that the former will not pay attention to him. Additionally, the friend may act lazy when it comes to actually helping his fellow. Therefore, the person must know that in addition to his friend's love and care, he will also never ignore him or grow negligent. I think for a lot of people, having a mashpia touches on a lot of these factors. Because the mashpia makabal relationship, mashpia mushpa, whatever you want to call it, relationship, has a lot of trust based on it. And, I, and one of the comments I get the most when I'm discussing with somebody about shidduchim or something, and I'm like, oh, did you speak to your mashpia? And I hear this a lot. It's like, oh, yeah, but she doesn't have time. I, I, or, or, or some people who are a little more honest, they say, I feel bad taking up her time, right? And that feeling of I'm too rushed. I have no time for you. I, I just don't have, I can't 
hold space for you because I'm, I don't have time for you or I'm, or I don't care about you. All of those things, they break down that relationship. And we have to keep in mind that it's coming sometimes from either side, right? Let's say with a mashpia relationship, sometimes we need to make the effort to reach out because they may not know that we want time if we don't ask them for time, right? Um, we also need to make an effort to reach out in their terms, you know? So for example, your mashpia is super busy between six and eight when she's doing dinner and bedtime with all of her kids. So maybe that's not the greatest time to call her. She could have time for you at a different time of the day, but not just specifically then. Does that make sense? So if we have, if we're able to have a good communication in regards to time and, and, and making that effort to connect with them, so then we don't feel that they're lazy. We don't feel like they're negligent. We don't feel like, fine, she cares and she loves me, but she doesn't make space for me. Does that make sense? Okay. The second factor, right? <clears throat> the person knows that in addition to his friend's love towards him, his friend will not ignore him, nor will he become lax in fulfilling his wishes. Rather, the latter knows that his friend has decided to fulfill his wishes and will make every effort to do so. For, for if all of the above were on top of we're on page 47 on the top right, for if all of the above is not clear, he will be unable to trust his friend completely because he knows that his friends may his friend may ignore him and may become lax in fulfilling his wishes. Only when the friend he is trusting possesses both of these qualities, meaning number one, he has great compassion for him, and number two, he is attentive to all of his matters he will be able to rely on him without any doubt, right? So imagine you have a great relationship with someone where you know exactly when is a good time to reach them, that when you call them, they'll make time for you. That's warmth, that's trusting, that builds a strong relationship, right? Now, number three, right? So remember, we're going in a process. Number three, however, even if he knows that person may have, been, may have the best intentions to take care of him, the friend might not possess the ability to do so. It is therefore necessary that in addition to the above two qualities, the latter also possesses the ability to take care of him, right? So it's very nice that he is very caring, he's very loving, or she is very caring, she's very loving, she's very compassionate, right? And she'll make time for you. She'll tell you, yes, you can call me anytime, you know, within this frame of, you know, between 12 and one or whatever. But if he's not able to do it, if he's not able to actually help you, then the time is nice and the care is nice, but he can't do it or she can't do it. She can't actually do what I need them to do. Right. So the third factor is the person being trusted must be so strong that he will not be won over by others who try to oppose him regarding any matter that he wishes to achieve. Nothing will stop him from fulfilling the request of the one who is trusting in him. For if he is weak, then the trust in him cannot be complete. Despite his clear compassion and attentiveness. Why? Because in many situations, he will be lacking the means with which to fulfill the wants of a person trusting in him. Only when all the above three qualities are combined and are present in a friend, will he be most appropriate for a person to place his trust in him. Okay, so if let's say we have, I mean, for lack of a better example, but for safety and security, let's say we call where at some point, someone else is in a situation where they don't feel safe and they call the police. But let's say the police comes and they come completely without a car, unarmed. They have no qualities or training. He's just wearing a police outfit and that is it. And we know that he's not actually able to protect us then that police guy might be the most kind. He must be so empathetic. He is so compassionate. He even made time for you. He made up time to actually show up and be there for you. But if we don't feel like he's going to be able to take care of us, that's not trust. We can't really trust him, 
Does that make sense? So we have to have confidence in that person's ability to take care of whatever it is that needs to be taken care of. Um, there was actually an incredible, <clears throat> I'm in the, in the middle, so I, I, whatever. I'm in the middle of reading this really great book called A Life-Changing Mashpia, Reb Shlomo Chaim Kesselman. Um, I've really wanted to learn about Reb Shlomo Chaim Kesselman for a while. And many years ago, they came out with a two svarim and they were all in Hebrew, but the Hebrew was just very advanced. It was biography Hebrew as opposed to like, the Hebrew that we're used to, you know? Um, so then I kept staring at it and I would like try and learn it with my husband. And it's just like, it's been sitting there. And then finally, a few months ago, it came out with the English. It's not the exact translation, um, but it's, it's, it's the information I wanted to get. And one of the most incredible stories is that Sir Shlomo Chaim Kesselman um, is the youngest mashpia ever appointed by all and and he was also appointed by three rabbim as mashpia of tamchit mimim he was originally appointed as mashpia when he was 25 wow. by the rabbi rashab then he was appointed as mashpia by the friedrich rabbi and then he was appointed as mashpia by our rabbi so i haven't gotten i'm still by the friedrich rabbi section of the so I'm, i haven't gone all the way through but it was a really, really, really powerful story that I think has to do with what we're discussing. Um, he spent many years being mashpia in Tamchit Mimim. And then, as we all know, history in <laughs> Russia back then is that they came, they shut down the yeshiva, and everything had to go underground. So the Frida Kraba encouraged him because he was such uh incredible mashpia encouraged him to continue opening up schools so wherever he went he was fleeing he got caught a few times um but wherever he went he opened up a, a, a yeshiva somewhere so some of the most incredible stories and i definitely strongly encourage um you can pick up this book and read it yourself so there are beautiful stories and i hope during during the classes i'll be able to bring in more of his stories but one of the most powerful stories was that at a time when the Frida Kraba fled Russia and he actually made it to America, all the Hasidim in Russia could not be in contact with someone that they could truly trust, right? So we're, we're discussing these qualities and most people feel these qualities with the Rebbe Hasid relationship. And when it came to the fact that the Frida Kraba was not physically in Russia, many um, chassidim were struggling with that. And the Frida Kraba had, had set up and he had sent out messages that they should contact big mashpim and try and build that type of relationship. That way he could feel that these, meaning he, the Frida Kraba, could feel like he's still having hashpah, he's still connecting to the chassidim even behind, you know, the Iron Curtain. And Rabbi Shlomo Chaim Kesselman, A, did so, and also he was one of them. And the beauty of this type of relationship that he had with the Friedrich Rebbe is that even, even while the Friedrich Rebbe was not there in person, he was still able to connect with him. He was still able to and what he would do is he would write letters and he would write letters and he would write letters. And even later on, he fled and he ended up in an Eretz Yisrael and he was in a displaced person's camp, not displaced person, but yeah, like inter mid intermediary camp before. And at one point he wrote to the free crab, where should I go? He got offered a job in three different, I think it was three different places. Where should I go? The Frida Kraba answered him back in two separate letters, and both letters got lost. And he was living in not the best conditions. His whole family was not in the best conditions. And he stayed an extra two months because he wouldn't make a decision without the guidance of the Frida Kraba. And Baruch Hashem, the Frida Kraba realized, the, he, the Maskirim realized that the letters got lost because then he received letters continuing on as if 
he hadn't, you see what I'm saying? Like the free throw received the letter. Hi, I still haven't gotten your, and so Baruch Hashem, they were able to send another set of those same letters. And two months later, he actually moved to wherever he needed to move. But it's just very interesting to have, to be able to set that relationship of trust and to be able to have it. And even when the Friedrich Rebbe wasn't there in person, he still made that effort. And I feel like we can learn from it in our current situation where we can still have that trusting relationship, that loving, compassionate, the Rebbe is there for us, cares for us, he's here for us, and he's, he's answering us even now. Does that make sense? I just wanted to bring that story in. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So we're on page 47. We have reached number four. So number four, however, even if the person cares, is diligent and shows the ability to overcome any obstacle, he may not always know what is in a person's best interest. It is therefore necessary that in addition to possessing the above three qualities, he also knows what is in his best interest right? So the fourth factor, the one who is being trusted knows which things will be of true benefit to the one who is trusting in him. And that which is good for the trusting one will not be hidden from him, both in situations where the benefit is apparent and in situations where the benefit is hidden. So let's take a moment to understand that. What does that mean? We need to trust that when we call someone for guidance, they'll have the right answer for us. Imagine you call someone, she's very loving, she's very caring, she's very wonderful and makes time for you and she's able to take care of you, but then leads you to what she thinks is right, which may not be what's right for you. You need to know that they have your best interest in mind. A, a good example for anyone who's heard of our Shaduchim course, I always say that having the post date for bringing is best done with a mashpia as opposed to the shadchan. And again, maybe your shadchan is your mashpia, and that's a whole different discussion. But to have a discussion with a mashpia who you know and you trust that she cares about your best interest as opposed to the possibility, and I'm not saying Shadchanim, Baruch Hashem, Shadchanim are amazing and they're all beautiful and wonderful. Um, all of them, Baruch Hashem. So Hashem should mention with a lot of clarity. Amen. Exactly. Um, so sometimes Shadchanim may want this Shidduch to continue. And that may not be your best interest. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have to be very we have to be confident that the person we're speaking to has our best interest at large at, at you know has our best interest and um yeah okay one second so we have an asterisk on the top so we're going to read the asterisk on the bottom <clears throat> apparent and hidden in other words a person who not only knows what is visibly good but can also know the consequences of his decisions for example a king might consider promoting a confidant to the rank of a commander in his army, but such a move might enhance the chance that the latter will be taken prisoner by the enemy. For true trust, the person must have faith in the one who is trusting that the latter is fully aware of the consequences of all decisions made on his behalf, right? So sometimes he might be telling you something, he might be leading you in a certain direction, and you end up wondering, one second, does he really know what's going to lead after this? You know how we play dominoes, like the, the domino effect, right? So this decision leads to something else, to something else, to something else, to something else. Do they know the full extent of where this decision is going to lead? Does that make sense? So not only do they have my best interest, but do they know the end result of my best interest? Do they know what's going to be at the end of the whole situation? Now, back to the main text. For if the friend does not know all of this, then the person trusting in him will lack the peace of mind to rely upon him. Only when these four qualities come together in the friend who is being trusted, knowledge of what will benefit his needs, ability to help him, active attentiveness and compassion, 
will trust in the friend be strengthened without any doubt, right? So I have one, two, three, four. If we have all of those, then we can trust somebody. Does that mean we can't trust anyone ever? I taught, I think last time we, did we I think I think last time when we taught this, or who was I having, I can't remember. I was having a discussion with this with somebody. And she was like, that's it. I'm not trusting anybody ever. And it's like, that's not the point. <laughs> we also have to realize we live in Gullis and we, not everything is perfect. Nothing is perfect to be exact. And someone who is trying to build that trust, we can still make an effort to trust, even with the knowledge that may not have the full extent. Does that make sense? Like we don't, our mashpia doesn't know every single outcome of every single thing that she's telling us to do. But we trust that at least she has most of these qualities and therefore we should be able to trust her. Okay? Same thing with your husband. Same thing with whoever. You know what I mean? Whoever you choose to trust, have in mind that they don't have to be perfect and fulfill all of this. They can. Thank you. Exactly. They can't. And that is the point. And at the end of the day, we turn our trust to the one who only, the only one who truly can, which is Hashem. Okay. The author now continues by saying that in addition to all of the above qualities, the person must be under the exclusive care of the one he trusts in for all of his needs. Since the person has always taken care of him, he will trust that the person will continue to do so. The fifth factor. Okay, you ready? The person being trusted is the only one who has taken care of him from the beginning of the latter's existence through his development the nine months when he was in his mother's womb and the days of his infancy and childhood, youth, adulthood, old age until the end of his days. So let's see. Can anyone, anyone truly care for us from the extent of conception and nine months of pregnancy and da 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 da, da till the end of days? No, no. And this is where we hit that like, Okay, I guess this is getting more clear. We know where we're going. What, who is the only one who can truly care for us from that point to that point? Hashem. Okay, when all of this is clear to the person who has secured the trust, it will surely lead to him, rest, lead to him resting his mind upon his friend and relying on him to be his support. Due to the good that a friend has done to him in the past, and as a result of the benefits that the friend receives from him every moment, all this will sure all this surely leads to a strengthened trust in his friend. Right. So now let's take a moment to think about this. Okay. If you want, you can close your eyes. You don't have to. But when you were in your mother's we always say belly, stomach, but it's not really the stomach. In the womb, when you were in your mother's womb, Hashem was there at that point taking care of you. He was taking care that you were growing healthy, that you were getting all the limbs that you needed and everything that you needed. And even if something was less than perfect throughout pregnancy, that is what you and your neshama particularly needed. And he was making sure that everything was happening to the to the minutest detail. Then you were born and Hashem was there throughout your birth. He made sure that you were born exactly in the way you're meant to be born. And again, even if the birth wasn't the most simple or easy and things happened, Hashem made sure that everything that needed to happen to you, that you and your neshama needed to go through would happen to the T. Then he took care of you as you began your infancy. Then he was there for you when you took your first steps. He was there for you when you ate your first food. He was there for you when you started your first day at school, whether it's preschool, first grade, whatever, every single first day at school of any age that you were at school. He was there for you when some bully probably said something nasty and he was taking care of you and holding your hand and it probably felt not fun but he was there for you there and he was there for you when you got in trouble for that thing we all know that thing you know that thing that you did you got in trouble for yeah yeah that one he was there for you then <laughs> whatever that thing is for you specifically and he has been there every single moment of every single day of every single breath you have taken even right here, right now. That 
same Hashem. Now that we've seen that he took care of us from then, and we know that he's going to take care of us from this point on, how can we not trust in him? How can we not trust in him? He took care of us all the way from then, and he's taking care of us from this point on. Okay. Now we're on page 49, number six. But this is not enough. Ah, so now we went through our entire childhood. We were in our mother's womb. Ah, still not enough. What, could, what else could possibly be? Because even if a person has been cared for exclusively by another until now, someone else may possibly interfere and cause him harm. Only when the other person is the sole individual with the ability to do good or bad to him that he can be fully trusted. The sixth factor, the person who has trust in, sorry, the person who has trust is completely in the hands of the one who trusts. No one else is able to harm him, help him, do good to him or protect him from harm. Just like a servant who is tied up and imprisoned, who is completely under the jurisdiction of his master with no one else able to do anything to him, neither good nor bad. When the person who has trust is completely under the jurisdiction of the one he is trusting in the manner outlined above, it will be even more appropriate for him to place his trust in his friend. So now think about it this way. Imagine that there's Hashem and Hashem took care of us when we were born and we were, right? We did that whole process, right? But now imagine there's someone else. Someone else is going to be like, and push Hashem aside and be like, I'll take care of her now. Now we have to reestablish all these rules. Are they caring, compassionate? Do they have time for me? Do they know the end of whatever decision they're encouraging me to take? Are they holding my hand? Did they take care of me before, right? If there's someone or something else other than Hashem that could, that could do anything to us, then we have to restart the process all over again. Does that make sense? So in order for us to be fully able to trust in Hashem, we have to be conscious of the fact that there is no one else, nothing else other than Hashem. There's nothing else that we could put our trust in that has all these qualities. There is nothing else that is taking care of us more than Hashem, or period, other than Hashem. Does that make sense? Now, some might think, and uh, it's, it's a good for a ring to have, and I know we've discussed Parnassim before, but we might think that when the paycheck comes in, the method of how the paycheck is coming, that's a process that can be trusted, right? Whether we trust our ability to work, I put in the hard hours, I went to work, I did my job. So therefore money comes in. That's one option. Another option is I put in the hard job and my boss is giving me the money. My boss is the one that's making sure that the finances are taken care of. So therefore my paycheck comes in. Just to point out that there have, it's, it's a possibility that even though now in writing, as we're discussing this, it's very clear. What do you mean? We can't trust anybody else. Hashem is the only one that fits all of these, right? But it's possible that somewhere, our Yitzhahara is telling us that something else can be trusted. Whether it's our boss, whether it's the bank account, whether it's the, you know, something else is taking care of us. Something else is what's providing us with our livelihood. Chasa Shalom, someone in a medical situation, something else is providing their health. Right? So it's clear here in the book, but when we take it out into... A real life example, it's like, let's take a moment and remember that nothing else fits all of these, only Hashem. 
And at the end of the day, Hashem is the one. Yes, does he use a bank account and provide your parnasa through your boss, provide your parnasa through your hard work? Yes, Baruch Hashem. He uses methods, but Hashem is the only one taking, taking care of you. Does that make sense? Okay. Finally, number seven. The author says that the friend who is being trusted must be known as generous and kind, both towards those who try the sorry, both towards the, towards those who deserve it and those who do not. For if this quality is not present in that friend, he might give up trusting in him, thinking that he is undeserving of his friend's kindness. This is a biggie. The seventh factor. The one who is being trusted is extremely generous and kind, both towards those who are deserving of his kindness, as well as those who are not deserving. Huge. Now, raise of hands. Raise your hand if you're absolutely perfect. Come on, everybody. I know it. There you go. We have one. Humble. <laughs> Very humble. You are perfect in your humility. <laughs> So being that we're all perfect, right? So we all have reason to think, of course I deserve Hashem to take care of me. Duh. I've never made a mistake ever in my life. Said no one. You just told us that. <laughs> right? The, 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 that one. It's on recording. <laughs> right? So we think we did. Number one, he, is Hashem caring and compassionate? Is he caring and compassionate? Yes. Does that, is Hashem capable of taking care of us? Yes. Does Hashem make time for us and be there for us? Yes. Was Hashem with us all throughout from beginning till the end? Is he going to be with us the entire time? Yes. Does Hashem know that if he directs us in a certain path, he knows the end of what's going to happen after we go down that path? So he has everything. Ah, but I'm not deserving. I'm not good enough. You know, that one time, Yom Kippur, that I da-da-da, that one time, I'd say Shabbos, that I da-da-da, that one time, you know, we all have that one time that we did da-da-da, right? And so therefore, Hashem's not taking care of me. That's it. It's finished. He's very good. He'll take care of the perfect person, everyone else. He's taking care of everyone else. I'm just not fitting. And I hope no one feels this way, but I happen to have heard some Yetzirahs somewhere sometime saying such things right we have to realize the seventh factor the one who is being trusted is extremely generous and kind both towards those who are deserving of his kindness as well as those who are not deserving additionally his generosity must be constant and his kindness continuous Never ending and uninterrupted. One second. Okay, we're going to read that in a second. Right? So not only did we not earn it, let's say we did or we didn't, or uh, even if even if we didn't, which I'm sure everybody here did. But his kindness is continuous, meaning all the time. His kindness is never ending. It doesn't stop. And his kindness is uninterrupted. It's not like, oh, Hashem's just ignoring me for now. He took care of me before, but he's just, he, he set me aside. He has better things to deal with, you know, the situation in China. Like there's important things over there. I'm just a little, I'm just a little me over here, right? <clears throat> no, Hashem cares for you uninterrupted from beginning till the end, doesn't stop. And he loves you and he takes care of you regardless of what you've done. Or not done. Is that, is that sinking in? Now, let's read the asterisk on, on the bottom. <clears throat> as well as those who are not deserving. With this statement, that trust will, pre will produce positive results even for the undeserving person, the author shows the distinction between faith, which is Amona, and trust, which is Betachin. A man who has faith that Hashem is in control of the world does not necessarily expect a good outcome because he is worried that his spiritual standing 
and doubts whether he is deserving of divine blessing, right? So is Hashem all powerful? Yes. But, you know, I didn't do the things I needed to do in order to take care of it. I didn't, I didn't do what I needed to do in order to earn it. Now, the man of trust, meaning that's a Muna. A Muna is knowing that Hashem's in charge, Hashem's, but Hashem might give me something that's no fun for me, right? Because I didn't deserve it. This is my uh, punishment. Ooh, big bad word. But now, Bitachin, however, Bitachin, a person, a man of trust, however, has no such doubts. He has simple, unadulterated trust that his requests will be fulfilled. In the words of Rabbeinu Bachia, the believer possibly has no trust for he may fear that his sins will cause him to suffer or that he already received rewards for his good deeds. Um, and as we learned in the previous, we, we discussed it already before, um, but Likotei Sechaz, Ahmed Vav, Shmai Secha, the first one. Aleph, it's incredible sicha. I definitely suggest everyone learns it. Um, actually, something very interesting. Um, during our engagement, my husband and I actually learned it together, and we made it our like this is our goal in life. Like we want to have this plastered on our wall, not physically plastered, but because we live with it so much. So it's a shame we should continue working to fulfill that. Um, Right? So what's the difference between a Muna? A Muna is Hashem's in charge. He's taking care of it. Betachen is Hashem's in charge, but he's taking care of it for my good. And I trust that he will. And as it says, simple, unadulterated trust. We don't have to uh, do cheshbenes. Oh, you know that mitzvah that I did? Oh, you know, so Hashem already paid me back for it. You know that Avera, now this is my punishment, right? No cheshbenes. Hashem can and will take care of you for the good. Does that make sense? Yes, exactly. Now, let's turn to page. Let's go back for a second for everyone with their books. <laughs> um, we're on bottom of page 49 and then we're going to switch. Okay, someone who possesses all these qualities in addition to that which was mentioned beforehand in the introduction and in the chapter, in chapter one, meet all of the criteria necessary to gain a person's trust. This then, okay, good. Baruch Hashem. Um, this then surely leads to the person who knows this about him to trust in him and to have peace of mind. As a result, of, as a result of his reliance on him both when it comes to the trusting person's behavior in public ah, and his behavior in private. Take a moment if we bring that one out, okay? In the trusting person's mind, never worrying about his needs as well as the rest of his body in his actions. And he will give himself over to the trusted persons as well to accept his decree and to judge him positively believing that even those things that seem to be bad are actually good, <coughs> right? So imagine, and I think we've had this, this um, example before. Imagine my incredible eight-year-old son. And for his birthday, he keeps asking, let's say, he already has a bike, but let's say he's asking for a bike. And comes... And comes his birthday and, you know, both parents decide instead of giving him a bike, which is, let's say for argument's sake, $100, we're going to give him $100 in stocks or in bonds. Now, we come, we package it in this beautiful packaging. We come, we're so excited. You know why? Because by the time your bar mitzvah, $100 could be $1,000. By the time you get married, $100 could pay for the entire wedding. This $100 is your life. It's the greatest gift we could ever give. So what? Oh, look at this. We find a beautiful bag. We even decorate it special for him. 
right? And we deliver this beautiful package with a written note saying, we invested $100 on your behalf. Yay! Yay! Yeah, He's going to be it. so thrilled, right? Baruch Hashem, we educated our kids and I think he won't be ups- he won't be angry, but he definitely will cry. <laughs> definitely will cry, right? So, was it what I did for him? Was that a bad thing? No. No. Did it feel bad to him? Yes. Yes. And then when, for his bar mitzvah, it turns into $1,000 and he's able to buy himself a million bikes. Not a million. He's able to buy himself a fancy, fancy bike and then some and a computer and whatever other things. Only a $1,000. And then for his wedding, right? Because he reinvested, let's say he makes a thousand, he reinvested into the account. And for his wedding, his wedding is paid. First year, he can go to Kylo without any problems, right? Wonderful. He'll be, thank you, mommy. Thank you, Abba. You took such good care of me, right? At that time, did it feel wonderful? No. So if we're able to trust in someone, and again, remember what it said here, not just in our behavior in public, which is good. It's a step. If we sound very betachem, betachem, betachem in front of our friends, so maybe um maybe it'll build you know it'll 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 grow but how much more so in our own private domain in our own space in our own time in our own mind in our own actions in our actual actions if we're able to actually trust Hashem that our actions really truly follow that path then we're golden then we're golden and not only that but through that trust, which is kind of what we're going to learn here, through that trust, Hashem says, wow, that's not easy. It is not easy to feel not great about this piece of paper saying that my parents invested $100. I remember from my bus mitzvah, actually, someone gave my birthday for, uh, for my bus mitzvah present. They gave me a, a little printed paper. It said, um, um, whatever, a hundred, a hundred dollars, or I can't remember exa- the exact amount has been donated towards the conservative show in your honor. I'm like, wow, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You know, but you know what? Setting that aside, a person gave tzaka in my schus. I wonder how incredible that schus is somewhere in Shemayim that this person doesn't usually get tzaka. He's not uh, someone who's from and he gave tzaka in my schos. You never know. Maybe that's my uh, $1,000 bond that I'm going to be reaping the rewards for the rest of my life. You never know, right? So continuing in our actions, not just in public, but even within ourselves. And feeling calm as opposed to feeling freaked out, that in of itself is hard. And Hashem gives you reward just for trying. Just for the fact that you try to feel this betachan, you try to feel this calm and this trust in Hashem, Hashem rewards it in of itself. Does that make sense? Hmm? Does Hashem give rewards? Yeah, Hashem, he helps. One day we'll learn the sikha, but in the sikha itself, it actually even says that. Because it's so hard to feel calm. Yes. Be- because it's so hard to feel that calm, Hashem's like, okay, you're doing great. That in of itself earns a reward. It's like effort trophies, but like real. <laughs> effort trophies, yeah. <laughs> but like the real things. It's like Hashem really knows. He really does know. And because that in of itself is work. That if it's that in of itself is work. Now, it's Hashem in the upcoming. Yeah, I don't think we have time for it. No, we don't have time for it. In our next class, it's Hashem. I'm gonna make a little marking over here. Next Wednesday night, Bez is Hashem. We will show, and this is where um, many people get stuck in Tanya, because <clears throat> Tanya brings in quotes to prove points. So people think, oh, in order to learn it really, but even, I need to go find the quote and the context, and then, and then they, they off into like some other topic, and you're like, wait, 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 let's reel you back. It was just used as a proof, okay? So here, we're going to bring in quotes that prove 
that it is only Hashem who's able to have all seven of these qualities. And so therefore, yes, should we work on ourselves to be a more trustworthy person? Yes. Should we work on ourselves to make relationships with people that we can have that type of trust with each other? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, only Hashem can fulfill every single one of them. Okay. Chaim, thank you very much. Um, and to be continued with Hashem next week. Let me just... Next week? Next week. We're regular now. Yay! Wow. Wow.